always stop with my hand, okay? Hello and welcome to Sassy Talks. I'm Savannah and this is the show. Why are you laughing in I'm the corner? Smiling. I'm smiling, I'm just smiling. I'm just enjoying it, that's all. Just enjoying your talk. <laughs> I'm smiling. I'm going to have the giggles. We're in trouble today. Goodness we're, in, we're in trouble. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> this is the worst thing ever. <clears throat> to I'm not ready. be able to stop laughing. I'm ready. But you need to not laugh. I'm ready. You know. Well, at least it's not anyone's funeral, so we should be yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. So hello and welcome to Sassy Talks. This is the show where we bring you tips for positive lifestyle choices. And on today's program, we have a gentleman who has been in the movie business for over 30 years. He's a showman. He's an actor, a director. He's produced films that have featured at the Cannes Film Festival and won awards at the LA and New York Film Festivals. He has then gone on to become a fashion designer and an entrepreneur in different ways. He is on the show today to tell us his story and how he has been able to achieve success, fulfillment and happiness at the grand age of... In fact, I'm not going to tell you. I'll let him tell you himself. <laughs> it's Leon Herbert. Thank you so much for being on Sassy Talks today. Hey, I'm here. What can I say? <laughs> and you're not allowed to make me laugh. See, this oh, one's trying to make me laugh yeah, in an it's intro. it's nice to make you laugh. It's nice <laughs> to make you laugh. It's nice to smile. Of course, it's Laughing important. Is good. It's a good therapy. It's the tonic of life. Yes, that's right. I've known you, Leon, for probably around 15 years. Yeah, it might even be slightly be longer. longer. And I came to know of you, Leon, through us working together on your feature film, Emotional Backgammon, when yeah, I was producing ago. content yeah. for this film that oh, went yeah. to the Cannes Film yeah. Festival. Yeah. You have had a career that spans 30 plus years in filmmaking, mm. in acting, but in a lot of other creative sectors mm. of the industry as well okay tell us your story first why why the movie industry why was that so important for you um it's the, the truth of it the movie industry it's a good question because the whole thing started from my mother which is really odd because and i came from a um seven day adventist background and i used to go to church and every so often they used to show films. And still today, it's still one of my favorite films. My mother said to me, right, we're gonna go and see a film at church. I'm like, okay, great. That's, that's a bit more exciting than the sermon sometimes. Anyway, being a bit naughty, I think. Um, and the film was The Ten Commandments. Okay. And when I started watching the film, I, went, I thought, wow, this is amazing. And it was from there that I said, I want to do this. I like this. And then and I, I realized that within that, all the time my mother was always taking me to the cinema. But I didn't realize that how much it was influencing me. When you say you wanted to do this, you wanted to be on stage acting or you wanted no, to I just make want, movies? I wanted to be it. I wanted to you be in the movies. I wanted to do everything. I, and. And when finally, you know, we had a TV at some point in the, when I was with my mother, um, and I used to always watch the making of things, which fascinated me. I was fascinated by that. I always wanted to sit on top of the camera and go, action! You know, <laughs> that a, specifically. A yeah, that was what I wanted to do. And then my other thing was I wanted to be a tailor. I wanted to go to art school. But my mother didn't understand it at the time, and she wanted, I mean, filmmaker's one thing, that's like, whew, you know. Uh, she wanted me to be a mechanic or a carpenter. I can't see it. In order to make a film, you have to write one. You can't just make something, you have to write it. And it's quite important for me at, the, at this particular point in time, because I was dyslexic, I still am. I couldn't write, and I was scared of writing. And one of the problems I had, even of being an actor, I couldn't read very well. Not realizing that it was actually my dyslexia. But I thought sometimes, am I stupid or something? 
But what got me over it was a, one, a friend of mine. And one day I started writing a screenplay. I was writing it by hand. And I wrote it. And after I finished writing it, um, I, I sort of get a, a friend of mine to correct it for me. And I went, oh, it does work. Then I showed it to a friend of mine, just a, just a paper, really. He read it, and he went, wow, it's amazing. I didn't know you could write it on, and he, and he gave me a computer. And that's how it all really all began. So I started to be more confident to realise I could live my dream. What I find particularly interesting about what you've been able to do is that you have created movies, you have created your successes, but always on a shoestring. My first film I ever made with a, with a, with a camera, like a, like what they call, ah, camcorder. camcorder, yeah. The old school, the old 1980s school, yeah, little yeah, right, old school handheld camcorder. thing that you get at Argos. I made a little sh film and I made it in actually my toilet, which is <laughs> interesting because it was my toilet at the time was made, it was all in black. And I made this film. And it was, and I made the, my, this room look like a corridor by just using the candle and blacking out all the lights. And I made, I shot the film with a lamp and a blue gel. And if I showed it to you, you wouldn't believe it. And that is actually my beginning. Okay. And so I always knew how to do things with very little. And as I went on, I, I, I saved up my money. Every time I got an acting job, I'd save up the money and I'd make a, a short film. So from that toilet shot I did, I realised what I could do. And that's how it started, because I was in a, I was in a Catch-22 situation. I couldn't get the sets that I want, and I had to get creative. Leon, how old are you? Um, should I really talk about my age? <laughs> yeah, you should. Being, um, I'm actually 67 this year. 67. No, oh, wait, wait. I would say I want to look like oh. you when I'm 67. You're very cool for 67. Oh, thank you. I'll take that as a massive compliment. You're welcome. You've actually reinvented yourself many, many, many times. Yes, you've been in the movie business for 30 years, you've made films, you've acted, but you've, you've then, at points in your life, changed direction and gone on a different trajectory. Why have you done that? Why have you decided to make those changes at various points in your life? Well, um, why did I do that? At the time, you know, the way the industry was for me, was I didn't think they were very interested in my ideas or what I did. Even though I'd made my film, there was no real interest in it because, you know, sometimes as people of colour, we're not supposed to be intelligent. So, you know, we're supposed to make films that bang, bang, shoot them up, killing something, street something. And I made an intelligent film that was called Emotional Backgammon and that shows a relationship through a game of backgammon, which was a little bit sort of, I suppose, a bit different. A bit different, but very relevant today. Yeah, but at the time, no one, there was no interest in it. Definitely ahead of your times then. Yeah, so it kind of made me feel a little bit um, sort of depressed. I got very, very depressed and I didn't know what to do. And I, I mean, I've done lots of other things. I can't tell you all in this interview. Um, uh, but um, I had to really try and figure out what I, went, what I could do, especially when you get to your age, when you get to this age of 60, you think, well, what do you do now? Because, you know, uh, you're programmed to be a particular thing. At 30, you get a house and you have children. 40, your kids are growing up. 45, 50, you start looking towards your pension and then 60 you're ready for the care home <laughs> well for those who are listening and not watching this leon is sat on his uh mustard velour sofa wearing a can i call it a burnt orange 
a velour tracksuit yeah. with a... It's actually velvet, darling. Velvet, darling. I'm <laughs> ever so sorry. I'm ever so sorry. V velvet tracksuit. Oh, yeah. And a neck scarf with an African print on it, which Leon actually designed himself. Because yeah. you've also been a fashion designer as well as all these other things that you're doing. But coming back to 60 and going through, going through that and going into all of this, is that the rein when I had to reinvent myself, I thought, well, what do I do? What, how do I do this? Because I'm not relevant at 60. You know, no one cares about your kind of like whatever, your old school. But I've never been old school. I've always, I'm always looking, I always look to see what's new. I've never lived in, I don't live in the past that much. I live in the future, I live in the now. And now is where it's at. Because you spend a lot of time with your friends and you're always talking about back in the day, which is all nice and fun. It's like very, you have lots of laughs. But I often say to them, what are you doing now, man? And they say, well, ah, just chilling, not doing much. And, I, and they say to, sometimes they say to me, how do you do it? You're always out there. You're always, you're still, you've still got that drive. And I said, because, you know, you, 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 what do you do? You, you, you die? When, what do you, you're going to drop dead? Or what, what do you do? You've got to do something. And in my reinvention, I thought to myself, I often used to get people come up to me and compliment my dress sense. And I've always designed things in the past, since I was a kid, I've always done lots of different things. And I thought, what do I do with that? And a thought came to me and said, T talk about a book or something, do something with a book about your style. And I thought, wow, well, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll try that. And that's basically part of my reinvention. And one of the things that within the reinvention, uh, as an actor, as you get to a particular age, no one's interested in you anymore, and especially black actors. There's no, no, there's no interest in you because you're too old. You're, you're, you get to a point when you said to me, how did it change? When you're 30, you're still the romantic lead. You get to 40, you're now playing the father. You get to 50, right, and all of a sudden, you're not older, you're not younger. You're in between, so you don't work. And for me, fortunately for me, that I didn't look my age. But still, I'm still older. So no one's interested in you anymore. So you have to, and at that point of 50, I didn't work at all. No one was hiring me. I'd kind of reinvented myself. I said to myself, when they ask me to go in for a job, I'm not going to do as I'm told. And I remember somebody said, they asked me, oh, it's a, it's a so-and-so commercial, you need to go in a suit. So I went, a suit? I'm not interested in a suit. So I wore my tracksuit. But I put on a tracksuit with one of my funky jackets and I had on Gucci shoes. So all of a sudden, my suit, it's completely the flavor changed. was switched up. Yeah, I've changed the flavor. And believe it or not, I got the job. And it kept on happening to the point where my, one of my agent said to me, the casting directors are saying, could Leon, could, could Leon dress down when it comes to castings? <laughs> 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 so I used to laugh my head off. I thought, great, <laughs> that was the beginning of my reinvention. What's yours is never going to pass you. And that even the day you die. What's yours is never going to pass you, right? So you have nothing to worry about. And the other thing is, the only one that's ever gonna discover you is you. In whatever you do, no one's gonna take you seriously unless you take yourself seriously. Mm -hmm. So you dressing being funky, that's the same as I am. I'm exactly what I would do. It doesn't matter you didn't get the job because it's not for you. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and if it was for you, you'd have got it. So that's how I look at life. <laughs> that's what I do. I do that all the time. And hence, that's why I'm the way I am. I don't really care. Because I know at the end of the day, I have to be me. Without me, where do I go from there? That's how you reinvent yourself.
figure out what it is. What is it got. about you? What Everybody is has something. To you? No, you might. We, we we sit and watch all the musicians. We watch all the singers. We watch all the actors. All the people that do better than you and think, oh, I want to be that. But they all have everybody special. We're all God's creatures and we're all special. We all got special things about us, no matter what it may be. But the problem is we spend our lives looking at other people. And what happens is, here's something a little bit esoteric. You your your um our brains are receivers of thoughts. We don't come up with ideas. Ideas are sent to you from the ether, from the universe, from your ancestor, from your past um, mother or brothers or sisters that's passed away. They send you messages. But what you tend to, what we all tend to do, our ego circumvents it. And the, e the voice of the ego is the, the voice we hear the loudest. But a thought that just came to you, says something to you, and, you, and the other thought, the ego says, oh, what kind of foolish, what do you think you are? You're this and that, and it completely tells you what you shouldn't do. To disregard it. To disregard all those, that rubbish that you just heard. And the other voice is the voice that's very quiet. That's the voice that you got to listen to. And taking it back to you before you ask me that question. Is that voice, because this is a really interesting uh, point, is that voice the quiet one, the one that's coming in, or where is the that voice The quiet one is the from? one that's coming in. The one that's coming in, right. The one, remember once, I remember once we had a situation and I said to you one day, why don't you follow? <laughs> your first thought. Your first thought. And you said, <laughs> and I've never forgotten this, he said, Leon, oh my God, I did it. I bumped into this friend, I did this, I did that, and you're absolutely going crazy. Now, think about this. That's for a, a very, second. very long yeah? time ago, I but know, I remember I've it. it. I remember it. I remember it. And the reason it. why I remembered it, because another friend of mine called Trevor Etienne said to me the other day, I was telling him the same thing, and he said, Think about this that your future self, in the future, we live in the past, present, and the future. Your future self, that's the voice you, that's talking to you. They've already done it. They're way down in the future and they're looking back at you and saying, this is what you need to do. And, you're, and then you've got that ego going, ah, who is he talking about? And your future self keeps talking to you, but you're not listening. Because as I said earlier in the conversation, I said, your mind receives thoughts. You don't come up with them. Our brain is just a receiver. Just like a radio station, you receive the, the waves. And we live in a world that is full of electricity. So hence, everything comes to you. What about thoughts? Okay, so what about thoughts that are based on past experiences. This is a question I asked somebody else in an interview recently. How do you tell the difference between your thoughts based on past experiences? If I touch that cooker, I'll burn myself, I won't do it again. It's like a database of previous past experiences. Then you've got your heart, that might be the emotional side of you. And then you have your gut, instinct or maybe that's this outside voice that's coming in how do you tell the difference between them and know which direction to go in because many people get find themselves in this situation they've got an idea but they doubt themselves how can you know which what do you think doubt part is? of you, just you said to it. listen to you just answered me they doubt yourself but you, how you, do you know which voice is which doubt is the loudest one simple doubt is the loudest voice the voice you're listening to is a very quiet voice. It talks to you all the time. It talks to you every day. And what you've got, we've got all got to learn to do is to listen to it. How do we do that, Leon? Stop listening. My way of doing it, this is just my way, yeah? My way of doing it, what I do, I know that voice now. I know my ego talking. And I say, shut up. I'm not listening to you. 
I, 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 is, my ego is, I, I imagine myself like this. That's my ego, that's my future self. And I'm in the middle. And I'm going, not interested in what he's got to say. I'm listening to this. And what's beginning to happen slowly, the quiet voice is getting louder. Mm. And the other voice, because I, and what happens is, this is a really strange way of saying it. It's strange what happens. When you start to say to your other voice, the loud one, you say, look, shut up. I'm have no interest in what you've got to say. I rule my ego. You don't rule me. It's almost like something inside you just goes, disappears. It's one of the weirdest feelings. You can, you'll feel it when you do it. You'll, you'll just, it just goes. It's almost like it just quietened down because it's almost like an entity who enters your body, your ego, and your ego is how you're, you're born with an ego. We all got egos. And how do you silence that ego? You've got to talk to her, talk to him, talk to whoever it is in your mind because you spend a lot of your time talking to yourself. All day long you're talking to yourself. And doubt is one of the biggest things. Doubt is your best friend. Doubt is the friend that you hold hands with all down the street. You love doubt. You enjoy <laughs> doubt. Doubt is your buddy. Right? It, that's why I said to you when I was, when I was t talking about your ego. Your ego if is full of doubt. If somebody says to you, um, I, I don't think you should wear that dress. Oh, it's not all that. And in your head you think, oh, I love this dress. It's fantastic. I don't know why she's saying that to me. And then you start getting a little bit upset about it. And you think, oh, maybe you're right. And doubt goes, that dress is horrible. I don't know why you're wearing it. Why are you thinking of like that? You shouldn't wear that dress. And you think, oh yeah, maybe shit person's right. But your first thought was to wear the dress because that's why you put on and showed your friend in the first place. But your doubt is saying, stupid, it's stupid. So is your doubt the ego? Doubt and ego, it's the same thing. They're the same thing. They're okay, the same okay, so it's the doubt and the doubt. ego. Okay. We doubt ourselves about every single thing we do every single day. And that's what you're referring to as the ego. Yeah, so I'm saying to you, instead of when some, that's why you have to get rid of your narcissistic friends because it's those friends that put doubt in your mind. And doubt festers. And all of a sudden, you're full of doubt about yourself all the time. So it's taking away, it's trying to make sure you're listening to your other thoughts and you've got to hear it. You can sometimes hear it. You might have a really negative thought about somebody. Uh, get rid of them. They not, have no place in your mind. We all have ne negative thoughts. We all talk about people that we don't like or whatever. And I have a new thought that I've put into my mind and it's, that's their choice. That's the choices that they've, they've made. I don't actually agree with them, but that's their choice. What can I do? It's their choice, it's not mine. So I try to stay away from being negative about somebody because you don't, you're not, you don't live in their shoes. You don't know what's going on in their lives. But we all have an opinion. Opinions are like ourselves. Everybody has one. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. It, it is, yeah, that's it. That's the truth. But it's that, that's what changed. That's, I would say, to be really, really honest, it was an epiphany I had one morning. And I went, hold on a minute. I can hear you, ego. I just heard you. You're telling me not to do something when the thought has already come into my head and told me to do it. So should we act on impulse then? Impulse, yeah. Act on impulse. Your impulse, what you call your impulse, is your future self talking to you. You know, I think if you don't act on impulse, moments after it becomes an, an act of blind faith to follow that voice. Yeah, yeah. but you need blind faith because the voice that's talking to you is in the future. It already knows what's gonna happen. But you're so, in your ego, you're so egotistical about everything. You think you control everything. You control jack shit. Do you believe in destiny? Of course I do. 
You don't control anything. Do we create you, the our destiny? Ego, yeah, our ego tells us that we're in control. And we're not. We're not in control of anything, like I said earlier. Two people were driving down the street and a tree fell on them. How are you in control? That's what woke me up. To say, hey, everything's as it should be. Whatever happens, it's meant to happen that way. Whether I get the job or whether I don't get the job. My way of thinking, I said this the other day, I said, the most high is my agent mm. as an actor. I get the job that he puts in front of me. Not the job that I want. It may not be, it may be, I may be desperate and I've been many times desperate to get a job and I never get it. And I think, why didn't I get that? I did a really good audition. I did, I was fantastic. I had a great interview, didn't get it. Because it was not, it's not meant to be for you. Because this is how your mind actually, re this is how it works. When you wake up in the morning, right, you're in a state between, because you're, what happens, your pe pi pi pineal gland, pineal gland, I, I never can say it properly, uh, is already opening, it's opened, because you're having these weird dreams or you're dreaming about whatever. So it's a state, just as you're waking up, the vo voices start speaking to you. But what happens is, you'll be there, like you're lying like this, the voices are telling you exactly how to deal with all your problems, because what's happened is, You've, you've solved all of your problems while you were sleeping. Yeah? Yeah. So you believe and you wake in up and it then? tells you exactly what to do, right? It does, it does. It does it every morning. But what happens is your ego kicks in. I can do this. I'll do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. And that voice is so loud talking to you. But the other voice has told you exactly what to do. But you don't listen to it. You choose not to listen to them because you're, you think you're in control. I'm in control of who I am. So your final message? Is to listen to that inner voice. Listen to your future self. It's always talking to you and it's always right and it's 100% right. And when you do it, everything goes right for you. Everything goes right. Leon, yeah. it's been a fantastic yeah. time. Thank you. Give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs>